I'm Mike Twitty, the Pinellas County Property Appraiser. Come on and have a seat, sir. Um, I'm joined today with our by our uh, Director of Exemptions and Staff Council, Alex Luca. He's gonna, we're going to tag team this presentation, um, minimizing missteps and maximizing saving, savings. It's the first time we've we've put this particular presentation together, so it's kind of a mixture of of some of the nuggets and um, takeaways that that we've garnered out of other presentations that we thought should be brought together and we think this will be a, a really informative session uh, for you all I'd like to remind you all it will be on youtube uh, afterwards so if you need to go back to reference it it'll be on our youtube channel which you can access from our home page you'll see the youtube icon up in the top right corner of our website um, there's a couple other ways you can get to it as well and you can always go back and, and look over our prior sessions that we've also um, done through the years so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Luca. He's going to start off the presentation, and I'll see you in just a little bit here. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us online in person. Uh, as Mike said, we're going to put this on YouTube after it's done. And in the meantime, while we're going through the presentation, if you do have any questions, uh, if you're here, please just you know, speak up, ask me, you can interrupt me, it's fine. Um, and if you're online, you can type them in the text uh, and we will try and answer those in the text. Or if not, they will go ahead and ask me and I'll answer. So feel free, just let them fly as we go. Uh, and we can answer any questions that become available. But as Mike said, we're, we're talking about minimizing the missteps and maximizing your savings when it comes to your ad valorem taxes. So we're really gonna go through um, your exemptions, your portability, uh, and some of the issues that we encounter uh, that that could potentially cost you money or save you money uh, down the road. So without further ado, we'll get started. We're going to jump directly into the exemption that most people uh, are aware of and that we have a lot of in the county, your homestead exemption. So your homestead exemption is where you your primary residence is. It's a personal exemption uh, and it is split into two different exemption. So it's commonly referred to as, you know, having the 50,000 homestead exemption, but actually it's split into two. Um, and then the save our homes cap is the second part of the homestead exemption. So if you qualify for the homestead exemption, you automatically get the save our homes cap. The save our homes cap can be worth a lot because every year it limits the increase of your assessed value to your home by 3% or the CPI, whichever is less. Uh, for 2023, it was 3%. So. so getting into um, discussing the, the, the homestead exemption. So your first 25,000 of the homestead exemption applies to all the millage rates, and it applies to the value of the home from zero to 25,000. Then your assessed value of the home between 25 and 50,000 doesn't get the second exemption or the first exemption, then the assessed value between 50 and 75,000 gets that second 25,000, which equals that the common 50,000 of the exemption that most people know about. But the second exemption between the assessed value of 50 and 75,000, it does not apply to the school millages. So when you're looking at your trim notice that just came out, you may see um, that you know the school taxes are a little higher than your other taxable value. Well, that's because this 25,000 doesn't apply to that. Then everything above that, you know, doesn't get either of those two 25,000 exemptions. So the qualifying criteria, you have to own and occupy your home as of January 1. Uh, January 1st is the assessment date for all property taxes this is the big date we're looking at did you own the property what was the condition the property was in were you in the property these are all or was the property rented these are all the the, the questions we're asking related to that january 1st date uh the filing deadline for homestead is march 1st of every year you can late file until september 13th uh, after that March 1st deadline, but we do like to get those in by March 1st. That is the official deadline to apply. Uh, to qualify too, you have to be a permanent Florida resident. Uh, what this means is when you apply for Homestead, 
we ask you to come in, bring in your Florida driver's license and vehicle registration. Um, we request those two documents because we try and stay in line with the uh, Florida Highway Motor Safety Vehicle Department. Their rule is once you become a Florida resident, you have to get a Florida driver's license and, and vehicle registration. And so when you apply for Homestead, we request those two documents and along with your voter's registration if you've got it. Uh, one Homestead exemption per person or marital family unit whether you're out of state or in state this is very important if you own a second home uh, there are a lot of other states that have residency based benefits so for example in ohio you've got one in new york you've got one and these are all residency based tax credits that you get well florida law says you get one residency based tax exemption so you've got to choose do you want the homestead in florida or do you want the one out of state and usually the homestead in florida is worth more than the ones out of state uh, no corporate entity ownerships for a homestead exemption it is a personal exemption it's tied to your social security number um, so when a property is held by an llc or a corporation um, you cannot claim homestead on that so a family unit, um, that is what the, the marital family unit, so they're entitled to one of these um, for, the, for the homestead exemption. So family unit is title one. Now, there are rare situations that's backed up by a whole lot of case law about separated spouses claiming two homestead tax exemptions. So in this situation, we have to apply a kind of two-part test to determine if separated spouses can entitle to uh, or entitled to two separate homestead exemptions. And the test is, are the spouses financial, completely financially separated? And do they not have a congenial marriage anymore? Uh, and so how we determine that is if you are in a separated marriage and you're each own property and want to claim homestead, both spouses have to fill out what we call a separate residences affidavit, which says on there that you don't claim, you know, your finances are not commingled at all and that you are married filing separately on your IRS. And we do ask both spouses for your most recently filed IRS to verify that. Um, then also on the questionnaire, it does have questions that verify that you're no longer in a congenial marriage, that you're not, you know, socializing with each other, going back and forth, vacationing, um, things that you would do in an intact marriage. So for these, um, that's what happens. And then, so if we do discover that you became married and you're claiming two homestead exemptions, there is a 50% penalty and 15% interest lien for the back taxes because of your improper exemption. So it's very important to notify our office if you do get married with someone and each of you own your own home uh, and have a, a, a homestead exemption because it's a really stiff penalty and, and uh, you know, it's very easy to just notify our office so we can determine which exemption is going to be worth more and remove the other one. So you can file for Homestead online. It's very easy. Um, you can see here that if you go to the exemptions tab on our homepage at pcpao.gov, you can apply online. Um, you can apply on the bottom left corner, or if when you pull up your property in our records, you can go to the quick pick tool on the far right side, which is the bottom right one here, and apply for exemptions directly on your property while you're looking at it. And this doesn't um, stop at homestead exemptions. If you're applying for a widow's exemption or a blind exemption, disability, your veterans, you can apply for all those exemptions directly online by clicking on these links. And it's a very useful tool. So we'll get in now to the Save Our Homes cap. So this is a big part of the homestead exemption. As mentioned earlier, it prevents your property's assessed value from going up more than 3% a year or the CPI. However, there are certain situations in which the Save Our Homes cap can be reset. Um, putting property into an LLC will trigger that reset. Even if you are the sole member of the LLC and you're paying income taxes as a pass through, it doesn't matter. Homestead uh, cannot be claimed by an LLC. It's a separate and distinct from its members. Um, the same thing happens with the 10% cap. There's a non-homestead 10% cap. So if you're not claiming homestead exemption, you also get a 10% limit on the increase in your assessed value. Uh, 
However, if you transfer the property into an LLC or outside of an LLC, maybe you're trying to protect your liability, well, it still reassesses that 10% cap. So it's something to be very conscious of when you're making ownership changes. Um, we often, you know, ask people to, to notify our office and, and, you know, let us know what you plan on doing so we can let you know the tax impacts. We're very, yes. Yes, you can, but it depends. So for trust ownership, if you are the trustee of that revocable trust, no issue. You get to keep your homestead. There's no reassessment. If you're the beneficiary of that trust, we need to review the trust documents because you have to have the right to occupy and possess that property during your lifetime as the beneficiary. So commonly you'll see um, what's known as land trusts. And in the land trusts, it will directly say that the person uh, has only a right to the proceeds of the property or the beneficiary only has a right to personal property. Well, for homestead exemption, you have to have some type of title, whether it be equitable, beneficial, legal, you have to have some type of title to the real property to claim the homestead exemption. So when it's in a trust, you can, it just depends on the language. And if are, you're the beneficiary, you'll usually get what we call a trust letter from our office. And it's just saying, hey, provide us the relevant copies of the trust that say you as the beneficiary have the right to reside on the property, and then we're done from there. A good question. Uh, so transferring to a new home. Um, so portability, uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it's a very common misconception that when you buy a new home, your homestead automatically is put on. It's not, you have to apply as of March 1st, that's the official deadline. It does not automatically transfer over. You have to either apply online or come into one of our offices to do that uh, and, and for the portability as well. If you're transferring the homestead from your prior home, you still need to apply for homestead and apply for the portability to transfer your Save Our Homes cap to your new home. Uh, our office does have kind of safeguards to, to help prevent this. We will look at your homestead application and when you put your prior address in there, if you put a prior address that had a homestead and it was your homestead, we'll usually reach out to you and ask, hey, did you intend to apply for the portability? Um, but it is technically the responsibility of the taxpayer to apply for that portability. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you sold it this year yeah. in 24. You got three years. So 24 is year one, 25 is year two, 26, and then January 1st of 27 is the absolute uh, deadline for you to occupy your property. So you've got some time, but you know, if it, if it keep, I understand sometimes the builders, it can keep you know can can keep getting kicked down the road so just keep that date in mind when you're trying to get get your homestead on the new one so trust we're going to get into that a little bit now we're going to be doing a presentation later in october that's going to dig a lot deeper into trusts and and tenancy and ownership um but as, as we discussed a moment ago you need to have if you're the beneficiary of a trust an interest in the real property not personal property you have to have the right to live there um, and the person who has that interest and ability to live there is the one that can claim the homestead exemption. Uh, the other requirement is that the deed transferring property into the trust does need to be recorded within Pinellas County. So homestead removal, uh, every year, we send out a notice around late January, early February. It's called a homestead renewal form. Now, most people look at this and just throw it away, but what it really is, is it's our request to you to let us know if anything's changed. If you wanna keep that homestead on your property, you don't have to do anything with it. You can't just, just toss it. But if you got married, if you, uh, you know, are renting the property. If something has changed, you need to indicate to that, that to our office so we can properly uh, remove the homestead. Now for this, this is talking about people selling their property, um, which is another issue we run into as well. So if someone sells their property within the tax year, they still have the right to remove their homestead and bring it to another home if they owned another home as of January 1 of that tax year. Now, you as the buyer, 
when they do the proration of the taxes, may be under the impression that you're buying the home subject to their homestead tax exemption for that tax year. Well, they may have removed it. And now when you did the proration, you're on the hook for the non-homesteaded taxes, which can be significantly higher. Um, so it's very important if you're a new buyer to you know, figure out the seller's intentions. Are they planning to remove that homestead? Are they planning to keep it on? Um, do they have a homestead? And you can check all this information out on our website. Uh, it usually, once we get a request to remove a homestead, it's approximately two to three business days to, to have it reflected on our website. So you can absolutely take a look on there and get a pretty up-to-date idea if that homestead is still on the property or not when you're buying a home. So some, something to think about um, because it is a shock when someone did a pro, you know proration. Yes. That is also, yes. So Mike, Mike makes a very good point here. Um, so if you do purchase a house uh, in Pinellas, anytime from January to March, the buyer, or excuse me, the seller could still legally remove their homestead at any point in time between January and March 1st. So if you do buy in that timeline, it is important to, to keep an eye on our website um, to make sure that that homestead was not removed by the seller. The homestead investigations and fraud, um, when we do detect improper homesteads, as, as stated before, there's a 50% penalty and 15% interest. If you self-report the error, we waive the penalties and interest. So if you're renting the home and you still got the homestead on it, and a year later you come to your senses and realize you shouldn't be doing that and you report it to us, the penalties and interest do get waived. Um, however, this does, is not always the case, and there is a way to report homestead fraud uh, if you do, you know, know of someone that's either renting the property and claiming homestead or getting an exemption somewhere else um, in a different state or even in Florida getting two exemptions, you can report it to our office uh, at the link below, and we do investigate every report that comes in um, and, and come up with a determination of whether or not that homestead was valid or needs to be removed and leaned. So we'll get into the non-homestead cap. I alluded to this briefly before. Uh, it was a constitutional amendment approved by voters in 2008. Uh, and what this does is for all property that is not homestead property, the maximum it can go up in assessed value is 10% per year. Uh, this, and this doesn't uh, cover the school millages either. Um, it, it's commonly known as the 10% cap. And um, if, if, you know, in the rising market that we've seen in the past few years, the 10% cap's been a little bit more of an issue. We had a lot of properties without it until recently, but it really does, you know, uh, limit the taxes on some of these homes that may have rise, rose in value very quickly. Uh, it has the same criteria for reassessment that homestead property has. So change of ownership is the big one. Um, so if the property sells, transfers, whatever it is, it is going to be reassessed, the 10% cap. The other trigger for reassessment is if you apply for homestead. Uh, a common misconception is that when you apply for homestead, you get to keep that 10% cap. Well, the 10% cap is the non-homestead cap. So when you apply for homestead, the 10% cap is removed, the property is reassessed to market value, then the homestead applies, and any in future years, you'll get the Save Our Homes cap at the 3% or less CPI. Um, so sometimes it's actually beneficial to not apply for homestead because if you've owned the property for a number of years under the 10% cap, your taxes may actually go up when you apply for homestead exemption. Uh, so we always ask people, you know, if you have a big 10% cap, ask our office first. We'll actually run a forecast spreadsheet showing you the cost benefit to having homestead or the non-homestead cap forecast out for about three years. Yes. Yeah. Um, question. And they said, no, you pay more for it. So that's your number. So it, it does get reassessed at market value. So when you buy the home, the following year, the property is reassessed at the market value. And we do take into account that purchase price. That is one of many criteria we take into account. We're looking at other sales of similar vacant lots uh, in the area. But when you buy it, if the prior, you know, if the prior owner had a 10% cap, it gets removed on that transfer of ownership to you 
reassess the market and now at whatever it is now it's it's capped at 10 percent And and yeah, Mike is, is bringing up a great point. I'm not sure if it's getting picked up by the microphone, but the ten because the 10% cap doesn't cover school millages, it can increase your taxes more than 10% because it's only on the assessed value of the mill of all millages besides school millages. So you may see an increase of more than 10% because it's not covering that one. Uh, so now we're going to get into the save our homes cap a little bit. This is the the big one, the 3% on homestead property. Uh, it was a 1992 constitutional amendment uh, spearheaded by the Lee County Property Appraisers Office. And as we mentioned, it limits your increase in assessed value to the lesser of 3% of the CPI. The idea behind it is they don't want folks uh, being taxed out of their homes. So, you know, you have a, a gradual increase in taxes uh, that's in line with inflation, but still capped at 3%. The difference between your just value and your assessed value is your Save Our Homes cap. And so you can see that also on those trim notices that went out, um, it will show you the just value and the assessed value. And the difference of that should equal the save our homes cap, which is at the bottom of the trim notice. You can actually see that full number there as well. So, you know, we're gonna go through just a, an example of how this works. So here, uh, we've got some values. So it's showing that the year after purchase, the property was reassessed and it's valued at 300,000. So then they apply for and receive homestead that first year after the purchase and the following year, the just market value goes up to 315,000. This is a 5% increase. And so the assuming that the, the 3% is, uh, is what the CPI was that year, that's the lesser. Um, the assessed value is now capped at 309,000. So you take the difference between those two, 315,000 and 309,000, and your Save Our Homes cap is $6,000 for that year. So you have $6,000 that you're not paying taxes on because it was uh, an increase above 3%. So, and then this is kind of what it would be over time, assuming the property goes up uh, you know, more each year. And you can see how you know, after seven years of ownership, um, on this this example here, that the Save Our Homes cap has ballooned quite a bit. So it started off at six thousand in year two. Uh, it doubled in year three as the property value continued to rise, continued to rise. And if you look at year seven, uh, it's now capped at forty-three thousand eight hundred thirteen dollars. So if your property continues to rise above uh, the the you know the minimum increase of three percent, your Save Our Homes cap benefit is going to continue to increase, and that is a benefit if you sold this home, you could take to another home. Yes. Yeah. I sold and save a home's benefit of $800,000. So you're capped at 500,000. That's the maximum you can take. Yep. So uh, the save our homes cap for demos and rebuilds. Uh, if you completely demolish your home, please notify our office your intent to rebuild. Um, so we can keep the homestead on your property during the rebuild process. So you need to have active permits on the home, but we'll allow you to continue to have the homestead on the property so long as you originally occupied it, then demolished it. So if you never occupied it and then you demolish it, you can't claim homestead. But if you occupy it, decide you wanna demolish it, you can complete, uh, continue to keep the homestead on there while it's being rebuilt. Um, I believe up to five years is what we allow. And as long as there's active permits while you're building it, if they all expire and void out, then we will need to, to uh, remove that exemption. So for new construction, this is another uh, com common misconception that our office has. They think that um, the three percent, you know, the save our homes cap applies to all increases of value to the home. So new construction does get added over your save our homes cap. Um, so if you, you know, 
uh, add living space to your home or make substantial improvements to the home, that value is going to get added over the Save Our Homes cap. Now, your, your original value of the home will still be capped the following year, but whatever improvements you finished in that year will get added over. Uh, now, this does depend on to what type of improvements. If you're simply doing maintenance on the home, you put a new roof on it, that's not going over the Save Our Homes cap. But if you added a you know, a wing or an ADU or something to the homes, so something more than maintenance will be added over the cap. Uh, now there is two at the bottom of this, you'll note that there's uh, for calamities. So calamities is the one exception to the new construction rule. If your home was damaged by a calamity or misfortune is what the, the statute says, um, there is a method in which you can rebuild and not have it go over the cap. And I believe uh, Mike will be getting into this a little bit later. So, and at this point, I will turn it back over to Mr. Twitty and he'll get into portability. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. All right. Good job, Alex. So, Alex showed you basically how we arrived at the Save Our Homes benefit. It's that difference between just value and assessed value on a property that can build up over time in a rising market. Um, that leads to the ability to leverage portability. Uh, so portability is essentially when you you move that that save our homes benefit from one homesteaded property to your next homesteaded property. And again, it's that differential there between just market and assessed value. Now the time frame we we had this gentleman out in our audience today asked a question about how much time he had. So again, just to reinforce that you you have three tax years. You need to be very careful about that calculation. It used it was originally passed in two thousand eight as two tax years, and what we found was many people were missing that ability. They were building a new home. They might have had financial. Um, disarray or a um, you know they might have gone through a divorce or separation or things that that occur that create a financial impact to them and they were not able to to replace that homestead within that two tax year period um, many of them they thought it was two years they do the calculation for two years from sale and that unfortunately is not the way it works so the only way you really got the benefit the full benefit of the two tax years is if you sold right at the beginning of a year if you sell at the end of a year, you've essentially already burned your first tax year up. So that's where a lot of people were getting in, in trouble, especially if it was new construction, because new construction can easily take more than a year um, on, on a lot of these homes. And then we ran into obviously the pandemic, supply chain issues, all those things that made it even more difficult. So several years ago, when I first came into office, I, I recognized this was a, a, a problem that we needed to address. And we were successful in lobbying the legislature to get a bill passed, turned into a constitutional amendment that was passed and extended that changed that from two years to three years. So now, even in that worst case scenario, you always get at least two calendar years. Um, I'm saying calendar instead of tax years, because that's essentially in a worst case scenario, which, which you could have if you sold right at the end of your first tax year. Um, but that has helped a lot of people save thousands upon thousands of dollars throughout the state of Florida. because This is a statewide amendment. So I just wanted to point that out that 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 three year window um, has really helped people out. So we get this question quite a bit. So how do we actually estimate portability and how much can I carry? And what happens if I'm moving down in value as opposed to going lateral or upward in value? All those things can affect how much portability you can take with you. So if you're making a lateral move or an upsize, and keep in mind, it's the value as determined by our office as the just market in each case, not necessarily what you sold it for. So it's not the sale price, it's how they were valued within our office. So you have to compare those two. So if it's lateral or upsize move, you can take up to the 500,000. And if it's a downsize, so in that case, your whatever your portability benefit amount is, it would get prorated downward. So, for example, if you went from a, <laughs> excuse me, um, $500,000 property down to 250, 
as determined by our office in just value and say you had $100,000 of port, it would essentially get cut in half. It would just be prorated downward. You'd be able to bring 50,000 for it. If, you, if that wasn't the case, you could have scenarios to where people would essentially not pay any taxes at all. They would completely wipe out their value. So, and the good news is you don't really have to do all this fuzzy math and, and work through this because we have a tax estimator on our website that will help you navigate this process. So it not only will give you a tax estimate on a home that you're thinking about buying or building, um, you can run different types of scenarios through it, but it will also address portability. So if it's in Pinellas County, you, it will actually ask you for that address and it will pull in the appropriate um, information to do that calculation for you. Again, it's always an estimate and by time of year, those numbers can fluctuate a little bit, so it's not, you know, don't don't take it to heart at, at a dollar amount, but it um, it's going to be pretty, pretty close. Again, this is just showing that that portability time frame of the three tax years. That we talked about, so another thing that that is often overlooked is the value of that that save our homes built um, benefit. So. You know, if you can have up to 500,000 of, of port benefit to the next home, if you have a divorce situation, well, it's an asset. And who gets how much of it? Does it stay behind with the former, with whoever stays in the former marital home? Does it get split? You know, is the, does the, um, you know, there's, there's several uh, scenarios that can play out here, you know. Um, and it can all depend on the financial arrangement between between those two two spouses. Um, you know, it may they may be making decisions based on are they both going to stay on the mortgage down the road, but only one is on title. Um, who's actually paying the bill? Who's actually paying the mortgage going forward? So there's a lot of things that can play out there. But one thing that most people miss, and and unfortunately, even even um, legal counsels are haven't really fully got their arms around this in many cases to realize how much of of an asset this is and that it really needs to be taken care of and addressed at the front end there's a form you can access on our website it's a department of revenue form it's the 501 ts form and there they really should fill that out while they're going through the settlement process and you can determine you can determine the percentage split of any port amount all right benefit there so you could say oh i want 100 percent to stay on the formal marital home and i'll take zero because i'm moving out of state you know just as as an example or i'm going to rent for five years so i don't need the, the port benefit so it should all stay on the house or they may say i want it 50 50 60 40 whatever they determine but many people don't realize this form exists don't realize that this really is supposed to happen at the front end. Um, we can address it sometimes after once that settlement has occurred. But unfortunately, what happens many times is one will sign over the sign over the title of the home, be completely um, disconnected from that asset now, and then they want to claim half of the port. And now they can't do it because they don't, they don't even own that a piece of that asset any longer. So just want to let people know that that is a, an important and invaluable consideration. So the tax estimator. So let's talk about that for a minute. Again, like we said, it's, it's a very pow powerful and very easy to operate quick tool. You can access it on the website in many different ways, either in the drop down menus, there's a speed button on the left hand side. Um, and if you're actually on the parcel, all you have to do is pull out this little toolbar and click the tax estimator button and it will actually run it. You don't have to enter any more information. You don't have to search the property address or any of that. It will just run that estimate for that particular property. Now, keep in mind, if you already own the property, you're already homesteaded, you don't want to be running this tool. This is not a tool to be running for a homesteader that already owns an asset because that's a different scenario. They're, they have a cap in place. This is for people that are contemplating a new purchase. So this is what's what are 
what are my tax implications going to look like when I cross the next January one under my ownership? So I just bought it this year. I'm wondering what it's going to be next year because this year I get the benefit in most cases if I'm buying from another homesteader, unless we have one of those scenarios where they strip the homestead. But in most cases, that homestead is still there and I will get the benefit of their save our homes cap and their exemptions until the end of that tax year. So that's where, unfortunately, when um, when new buyers are not properly informed by it, it could be their realtor, their lender, the title um, agent there, you know, there's really three first touches there with most buyers. And one of them should hopefully inform them that if you're a new buyer, you're going to go through this cap reset process. So don't don't take to heart that your first uh, trim notice and tax bill that you pay is going to ultimately be what it looks like because you're still getting the benefit of the seller's um, exemptions and save our homes benefit. So this gives you that snapshot of what it's going to look like in that future future year um, after everything has reset, caps reset, seller's exemptions have been removed. Now you're applying for your own um, homestead exemption, hopefully for that next year you'll get the 50,000 and then you'll start to build your save our homes cap over time. So you can see here, it's a real quick tool to walk through. Um, again, if you do it right from the parcel, this already pre-populates. You enter the estimated purchase price. If you were doing new construction, you could put your, your estimated value and construction of the new home. You could run that, you know, land and building. Um, keep in mind, if it is new construction, that value could change over time. The market may, may rise or fall over the construction period. So it's going to be where we end up valuing it on the January one, following its certificate of occupancy, essentially is, is basically that, that point in time that we're going to revalue that property. If it's new construction, uh, here you, you just check yes or no. Uh, whether you're going to transfer a homestead exemption. So that's that's if you already had a homestead and you're going to leverage port, that's where it's going to ask you. If I click yes there, it's going to open another little window and ask for an address of that prior homesteaded property so it can do the math for you. And then on the new home, you have this little yes, no here on whether you're going to have homestead on the new property. So when you answer those, You get a result that looks like such, and it will show you a breakdown of your current just value on on the subject property versus the prior property. If it was a if you had a prior homestead, it will show you the um, the differential and what your save our home portability benefit was, a new estimated assessed value, and then the resulting ad valorem taxes, and if there are any non ad valorem assessments in that location that's your special assessments those are usually flat rate assessments based on on locale um, by different um, taxing authorities you can get your gross amount there so and you can always modify this estimate start a new one i would do want to jump back i want to show one thing on this so if you, somebody is out there and they're actually shopping for a new home and they want to use this tool because if you go to most of your online listing platforms that are out there, whether it's a Zillow or realtor.com, a Trulia, any, you know, there's, there's a myriad of listing platforms now. And most of our new home buyers are shopping those online platforms as their first touch to try and look at the inventory that's in the market. Well, please do not rely on their tax estimators or the seller's tax, uh, the taxes that they show on those platforms, because they typically show either the seller's taxes, which as we've learned today, can be very deceptive compared to what your new taxes are gonna be because that cap is gonna reset, uh, those exemptions are gonna go away. Um, or they might have a little calculator that does an estimate, but usually it's far too low. It is, it is not an appropriate estimate. So they're not, they're not doing their, their, um, their math correctly. So highly uh, recommend that they run this and one way you can do it is you can you can simply if you don't have an address 
and you just want to run it against value, you can come into this spot right here where it says select the city municipality where the property is located. Leave the address blank, just drop this down. You'll see a list of all the different uh, jurisdictions. You can pick which one. So say it was city of Seminole. You could pick Seminole. You could put in, say, I'm looking at half a million dollars, you know, $500,000, put that in as your purchase price. Yes, I'm going to have Homestead. And you can run that and it'll do an estimate based on the appropriate millage rates that exist at that point in time for that jurisdiction. So then you can even compare. So you could say, well, now, but what if I, you know, want to compare Seminole to Tarpon Springs? You know, so you can go back in, you can drop that down, you can pick another city and look at their, um, it'll grab their millage rates and it'll rerun that estimate. So I just want to let you all know that that's a, a great little tool there for if those that are out there shopping. Yes, sir. So um, this particular estimator is just our county. It's uh, countywide, so it works in all of our 24 jurisdictions. However, I will say that at this point, um, 66 of the 67 counties in the state of Florida have some form of a tax estimator on their websites. They all, they all may look a little different. They may not be as sophisticated as this one as far as many of them do not um, deal with portability, so they won't necessarily factor in your port amount, but they will do the, the at least the gross ad valorem uh, taxes estimate piece. And we are currently um, with our association trying to um, pass legislation that would require the online listing platforms to either have a link taking you to your respective county property appraisers tax estimator and get rid of the misleading information, or if they're if it's a very sophisticated platform where they're doing the the buyer payment calculator, you know that shows principal interest taxes insurance actually tap the data that we provide to the Department of Revenue each and every year and actually ingest those numbers so that they can give you a more realistic estimate. So we're working on that legislation as we speak. All right. So Calamity, I'm going to pass this one. Alex is a Calamity expert, so. Story of my life, yeah. <laughs> All right. So. It uh, we're getting into calamities now. We had talked about this a uh, little bit earlier when I, I touched on it, talking about demolition of homes. So um, there is a situation when you are rebuilding something that um, your new improvements to the home are not going to go over the Save Our Homes cap. Uh, and a calamity is, is the really the method by which that happens. So first, though, um, when a big storm does come through, um, we do have on our website now um, storm damage reporting. So if you do receive damage from a storm uh, or something along those lines, you know, some, a storm runs through and you receive damage, please, you can fill out this form on our website. So when our appraiser will come out and take a look at the property to see if we do need to depreciate the values for the next year uh, based on the damage. And this does get the ball started for our office to gather the documentation required uh, if you are going to be claiming that there was a calamity so your rebuild does not go over the Save Our Homes cap. So you can find this on the How Do I portion of our website and you'll go on here and there's a survey that you can take that gets uh, submitted to our office and then uh, your area appraiser will get that survey and reach out to you to, to do an inspection of some sort. Uh, the FEMA 50% rule. Uh, so this is something that does limit the uh, the improvements you can make to your structure. We do have on our website the ability to uh, generate one of these letters that gives you the value based on our values of what you would qualify for improvements you, under the 50% rule. Now, um, if you don't like our numbers, you can go get your own appraisal for the 50% rule. Ours are going to be based on the, the numbers that we have and our, our records and values are for tax uh, tax purposes, not necessarily what you get from a, from a private appraiser. Um, but you can do this if you go to your property and go to the tools. Um, you'll choose the FEMA win loss mitigation letter on there and it will generate one for you. 
Oh, actually, it wasn't as detailed as I thought on the calamity rule. So, all right, we'll get back on the calamity for a moment. I, I want to circle back on that. So the, the law says that you have to have damage to your property from calamity or misfortune in order for it to qualify to um, not be reassessed under uh, the, when the new improvements are done. Now, there are some limitations to this. So what is damage? Well, in Pinellas County, we translate that to you had to have some type of damage from a storm, a fire, some type of unfortunate event. Um, you know, but it's still a pretty broad term from the legislator. So what our office requests is like through the survey, some evidence of damage to the home, whether it be insurance payouts, uh, whether you have photographs of flooding that came in the home. Um, and we even extend that damage to uh, if you're a home that is a repeat flood home. If you have flooding, every year but maybe you didn't have it this year you decide you want to build up you can as long as you can demonstrate that there's been damage to the home due to that issue um, the other thing is that the amount you can rebuild is limited to 110 percent of the square footage of the home or 1500 square feet um, so you know it, you got to do a little bit of math there if your home was you know 1400 square feet uh, you could build a little bit above 1500, but if you're well below that, you can build all the way up to 1500. And then if you're above 1500, you can build 110% of that square footage. Um, something to think about is if you are building up and you do create some new space underneath, that may be assessed, but it's gonna be uh, you know over the cap, but that new area is usually gonna be assessed at a lower value because it's not gonna be you know finished space really. So it's not, not included in, in the, uh, the living area. So now we'll get into some common missteps as well. Uh, and so this, you know, I'll use this to, to promote my our next uh, topic that's coming in October. We're only going to briefly talk about deeds today. But one of the primary reasons that we see folks getting reassessments on their properties is because they file a deed and they did something with the tenancy incorrectly. There's a lot of different types of tenancy, how, you know, methods by which you can own your property, like trusts, as we had discussed a little earlier, um, through survivorship, tenants in common, married couples. Um, but all of these can have a different kind of impact on the exemptions you're entitled to. Uh, so if you file a deed and you have the incorrect tenancy on there and you don't correct it prior to January 1st of the year, uh, the, the following tax year, there's nothing we can do to fix that. You may be out of 50% of your cap or a certain amount of your cap forever um, because you you know the deed was unintendedly uh, transferred some type of ownership to a different party. Um, so we know what we always say is when you're starting to do your estate planning or anything, you can contact our office, you can contact me, uh, and we'll let you know if you record a deed, if you, you know, even if you want to provide us a sample of the deed, we can tell you what the ad valorem tax exemption impact would be if that deed is filed, if it be nothing, or if you are going to accidentally lose a big portion of your cap. Um, and then examples of the changes, maybe adding a name, whether you're adding, uh, you know, a, a potential spouse or adding a spouse, adding children to the deeds. You know, you, there's a lot of different reasons for this, um, but they can have an effect on your, your tax exemptions. And then the big one is placing property in an LLC. It's not as common as it used to be, but it was common for a while. People were placed their property in an LLC, lose their homestead or lose their 10% cap. And um, it goes into the next tax year after January 1. There's nothing we can do to put it back. Um, so we say, please contact our office before doing these things. Renting homestead property is the next one. So if a homesteaded property is rented for more than 30 days in two consecutive years, and each year stands on their own, then the homestead is removed. So um, if you want to rent your property for 30 days in one year, 30 days the next year, you're okay. But if you go 31 and 31, you can't. Um, you know, or you could rent your property, you know, 300 days, one year and not rent it at all the next year to let it cool off. And then the following year you can start renting. So it's for two consecutive years. If you rent for more than 30 days, your homestead is removed. Uh, failure to notify our office. We will, you know, as I said before, the stiff penalties and interest. If we find out about it later, um, you do get a 50% penalty and 15% interest for the improper homestead exemption. And that includes your save our homes cap as well. So if you had a big save our homes cap on the property 
and you'd been renting it for a number of years, we lien you not only for the 50,000 exemption, but also for the save our homes cap that you improperly received. So some of these liens can be for a very large amount if, if someone doesn't notify our office and had been living in the property for a long time, um, but you know, renting it or something. And we do and we do investigate all of these as well. So make sure to look at those notices in February and, and let us know uh, what the status of your homestead is, if anything has changed. Uh, and after that, I'll let Mike get back in for the closing comments. Thank you. All right. Well, the pain is almost over. We're almost done talking. Uh, we appreciate you all being um, in person and online with us today. A couple of uh, uh, little points of information before we we shut down here, and hopefully you all you know got some good takeaways. It's a lot of information in a short period of time. We try to do these lunch and learns, break them into hourly segments, and just give you know some some helpful information that we we want people to not you know fall into these pitfalls and have these uh, missteps that can that can cost them money. So we, we do these monthly um, throughout most of the year. Um, we will be shutting it down in November and December because nobody really wants to listen to any of this stuff then. Um, but Alex, I'll put in another pitch in October. He will be doing that one that'll focus on trusts and tenancy. Um, October 10th. Um, so that's a great one to sign up for. So especially if you're you're an attorney or in title in the title world you know th that's a great session to really get inside the mind of alex's mind you know he is an he is a a florida bar attorney and um and also we're fortunate to have him in in our office as staff counsel and our director of exemptions so he really is is talented in that realm and has a lot of of great um answers for you so uh, that will be october 10th this slide here is just showing you you know examples of past programs and and others that we um just a sampling of some of the ones that we've we've held in the past we're always coming up with new ones to inject in and we'll continue to rotate those out throughout we try to time them up where they make sense best in the tax roll year whenever possible um, other ways to follow our office and keep informed we we do have um we are on social media via facebook and youtube as we talked about earlier so we've got that YouTube channel where you can find those informative um, videos on public education sessions, as well as website tips and tricks. Uh, you can sign up for one of our one or more of our three e-newsletters on our website. So we have one that caters to homeowners, one for real estate professionals and one for business owners. So there each month we shoot those out especially on the homeowner and real real estate professional side the business owner one is 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 has some gaps in it it's not a monthly publication um, that's more by time of year but those are a great way to follow us as well because we try to put out those little reminders hey you know this filing deadline's coming up you know little things that we're running into where the public might be tripping on we try to put those those um, helpful alerts out there so encourage you to um to follow us if you can and then lastly, I like to close with a service actually our clerk of the court provides. This is a free service. So I highly encourage people to sign up for it. You've probably heard radio ads, TV spots for different deed fraud alert products that you can pay for. Well, this is one that you can get for free. The, the clerk already subscribes to this service. Um, so you can go to this, this link and in about five seconds, you can enter your name that you want tracked and what will happen is if anything gets recorded in official records with a name that matches or is very close to that name, you will get a notification via email or text or a phone call, whichever you prefer. And if it's if it's the text or an email, you'll actually get a link to the OR book and page into the clerk's official records. So you can look at that document and see if that document is appropriate. Because if it wasn't, if it's a fraudulent deed, for example, now you have you've you've identified it much quicker than than most would. And you'll be able to reach out to law enforcement and try and recover any damages that might have been done as a result of that fraud event. Um, 
it's it's great. I use it myself. It even you know it alerts you if there's satisfactions of mortgages, um, a notice of commencement by a contractor. You know all those things that that flow through official records. Um, you'll get a notification for. So, just want to leave you with that that nugget here at the end. And with that, we thank you for joining us. Again, I'm Mike Twitty. He's Alex Luca. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can see you can reach out to us there. There's some contact information. And you can, um, our average on hold time in our office is under nine seconds. So if you give us a phone call, you're going to get a, you're going to get a live human being pretty quickly. And we encourage you to um, use our office as a resource when necessary. And we hope you have a great rest of your day.